Hello everyone and welcome back to the Introduction to Python course. So in this video, Logan is going to continue with his discussion on Python by taking a look at data types. Now this really is kind of backing away from the language just a bit, right? Exactly. We're getting back to some language fundamentals here. We're going to be talking about data types and how they relate to Python. This is done as kind of a precursor to variables. Of course, once we get into the variable discussions, we'll have to deal with variable data types. So before we get into that discussion, we're going to discuss data types by themselves. What are data types and what do they mean to us as Python programmers? Okay, that sounds good. Well, to begin, let's talk about data in a computer system uh, before we get on to why we would want to type that data. In a computer, one of the interesting things that a digital computer system does for us is it generalizes the storage and transmission of data. When you're talking about a computer in terms of memory, hard drive, or data transmission, such as over a network, you're generally not worried about what kind of data it is. You're only asking yourself, well, how much and how fast? How much data are we transferring and how fast can we transfer it? That's right. That's really one of the cool things about modern computers. Now, data types come in when we want to go back and starting from that idea of generalized data and actually begin to interpret that data ourselves. Meaning to a computer, it's just fine to have everything being written as numbers, and it describes numbers using more numbers. That's right. But to us as a programmer, it makes it easier to recognize things if the data carries a specific type behind it. Now, we'll discuss that in more length as this video continues. But I want to begin with some actual concrete examples of data in a computer. Okay. Let's start with some numbers. Now, of course, in a computer system, generally, information is stored in binary. So basically, everything is indeed stored in numbers, but it's actually stored in binary, that being the native um, system of the computer itself. That's right. So when everyone says it's just ones and zeros, that's what they're talking about. Exactly. So let's give some examples of that. Let's say that we wanted to store and work with the numbers 2 and 5. So we've got the numbers 2 or the number 5. Now, what would this, these numbers look like to a computer? Well, they would be in binary. And without getting into a discussion on binary and base conversion, we can kind of take a shortcut by using the Windows calculator and some of its base conversion abilities. If we switch the calculator over to scientific mode, we see we have this group of radio buttons labeled hex, decimal, octal, and binary. So let's use this to see how the computer would see the numbers 2 and 5. The number, let's use uh, 5 first. If we convert the number 5 to binary, we get the number 101. Let's write that down. Now let's get the number 2. So back to decimal, we'll get the number 2 and convert that to binary. And that gives us the number 10, or excuse me, 10. Now in order to add this, just um, as though, it just as when we're using uh, base 10 or decimal, I'm actually going to space this over a little bit. That would be akin to saying that you had the number 22, and you wanted to add 5 to it, you'd actually space over. That's right. So in this case, we're going to add straight down, kind of like normal. 1 and 0 is 1, exactly. 0 and 1 is 1, and 1 and, well, there's nothing there, so we can say 0 is 1. So we're going to get 1, 1, 1. Exactly. Which I just happen to know is 7. It's really? a binary representation of 7, so let's find out. Because oh. 5 plus 2 should be 7. Well, let's check that. Back in calculator, we are still in binary. <laughs> I love how it's grayed out everything else. So then, wait a minute. <laughs> so if we input the number 111 into calculator and convert that back to decimal, that does indeed give us the value of 7. What do you know? So we can see if we're working in binary, as the computer would see numbers, really they're still just numbers. They're numbers. We can add them. We're doing kind of mathematical operation that the computer's capable of. So that's, that's all very easy. So the idea of storing numbers in a computer is not far-fetched at all. It does not take any stretch of the imagination to think of, all right, we can store numbers. Now what about some more complex data? What about text data? Mm, that's it, where things get a little bit more interesting. It's very easy to just represent solid numbers as you've done here. But hey. what if we had something like cat? All right, what if we had something like a word such as cat? Well, now we're talking about letters. What does a letter mean? Because in the end, when it's stored in memory, it needs to be ones and zeros. Exactly. That's the key thing here. If, if the problem is, let us store the, the word, the text, cat, into the computer, well, we know that one of the prerequisites is we have to have the data in numeric form in order to store it in the computer. How do we represent the word cat as numbers? Well, the answer to that is encoding. Encoding, as far as text is concerned, is the idea of taking the individual symbols or characters in an alphabet and assigning those characters a numeric code. That code is numeric, we can therefore store it in a computer. So, 
Um, I, and a quick example of this before delving into one of the actual character sets on the computer is imagine you just had a lowercase alphabet of the letters A through Z. You could assign each of those letters a number, 1 through 26, and that's, how you, and that's a very simple way you could associate those characters with actual numbers. Sure. Now, of course, in the computer we have more than just the lowercase alphabet. We have letters, numbers, character symbols, everything that we consider to be alphanumeric in nature. Now, going back to the cat example, let's start writing some stuff down here in Notepad. The problem begins with the word cat and us wanting to store that in numeric form. Well, we're going to need some type of encoding scheme to get this converted over to numbers. So what I'm going to do is bring up the Windows character map. And let's look at the characters that we have. Individually, the characters of this word are C, followed by A, followed by T. So let me write this down again with some more spaces between it. I'll put a few spaces between C, A, and T just so we have some room to write down some numbers. Now, over in the character map, we can see we have... Well, a whole lot of things. We have letters, numbers, symbols, a whole lot of alphanumeric information. Now, if we're looking at the word cat, let's locate the letters in this word, beginning with the letter C. If we click on it, we see that the character map gives us the actual character code, the number of that character. Now, keep in mind that here in the character map, it's going to be showing us this information in hexadecimal, and we and just for the purposes of quick translation here, I'm actually going to write it down in binary, which will be more familiar if you're used to looking at things like an ASCII character sheet. So looking at this first letter, we're presented with the number 63. Once again, this number is in hex, so we'll switch over to hex mode in the calculator so that we can punch in 63. Now before I write it down, I'm going to convert it to the more familiar binary, so we can see that this would be the number 99. So C can be numerically represented as 99. All right, let's move on to A. If we click on A, that gives us hexadecimal 61, and 61 converts over to 97. And finally, the letter T, we can do the exact same thing. We can grab the letter T, giving the hex value 74. 74 converts over to 116. So there, now we have three separate numbers. So much easier to store on a computer-based system, so we, ju we would just simply put these each one after another in a sequence to make the word. Now to give, an ev to give a better visualization, since we're talking about things also in binary, let's also convert these numbers to binary and write those down just to see what that would look like. So back in the calculator, we'll put in the number 99 in decimal, convert that to binary. I'll copy that number, paste it below C, and I'll space everything out a little bit so we can still see the individual numbers. Now the number 97 gives us A, so 97 converted over to binary gives the following number. And finally we need to convert 116, so back to decimal, 116 converts to binary as the following number. Now one thing I'll point out really briefly, that will become an issue if we decide to convert these using existing software. I'm going to count the number of digits or the number of bits in this first number and that adds up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7 bits of information. This type of text is more commonly stored in 8 bits in modern character sets, so I'm actually going to pad each of these numbers with a 0. And I'm actually going to remove the spaces also. So I've simply taken the spaces out and replaced them with zeros, so we're using 8 bits per number. And you'll also notice that I've taken out the spaces so we can just visualize this as one continuous piece of data. As a matter okay. of fact, if we were to add up the three blocks of eight bits, we'd end up with 24 bits of information. So in essence, we have just manually encoded the word cat into a binary numbering scheme. Okay. Now, just to test this out, let's load up a web browser okay. and show an example of someone else using a similar encoding scheme. We're going to go up to Google and let's find a binary to text converter. So I'm going to simply type in binary text. We'll search for these keywords and one of the first sites that comes up, or actually the first that comes up, is binary to text conversion. Let's go to that site and take a look at what they offer. En text encoding or binary decoding? Well, let's see what it thinks of our hand-encoded stream of information. Let's copy the stream of ones and zeros 
paste it in the binary decode window, convert that to text, and look at that. Wow, magically, some place on the Internet knew that a whole bunch of ones and zeros that we just came up with from the uh, character map represents the word cat. Very nice. So this is not just some madness we came up with. This is an actual encoding scheme that other people use in computer systems. So that's all well and good, but this still seems like a tangent when we're talking about data types. That's all well and good that information is stored as data, but where does this come in with different types of data? Well, here's the key. Are we saying that this stream of data only means cat? Is that the only meaning we could attribute to, to this? Well, the answer is no. If we took this, what if we took this entire long stream of digits and considered that to be one single number? What would happen? Well, I'm going to copy the entire number, all is one, and we'll just make sure that our calculator is in binary mode and paste the entire thing in and convert that to decimal. Hmm. A direct numeric conversion results in the number 6,513,012. So we can just for the sake of visualization, paste that into Notepad also, and you can see that for this stream of information, we can derive the word cat or the number 6 million and so on. So the idea here is that just by having the data, we don't necessarily know what it means, because of course 6 million and some could be the result of a mathematical operation, not necessarily something you would want to interpret as the word cat. So this is where is this is one of the reasons that in computers, especially in programming, we tend to assign type information to the data. So that way, just at a glance, we can say that this is cat instead of the number 6 million and some odd. And that makes it easier for us to apply the correct operation to the data. All right, let's move on from here and discuss what this means to us as a, as a programmer. First, um, of course, as we just discussed, that the idea of types, it sounds like... Now, here, here's a, a, another um, possible misconception, though this differs language by language. I want to be careful on how deep I get into discussing what type means as a definition, because that can actually change depending on the language in question. Typing can mean something different in C versus Python versus older languages, which were completely untyped. But just at a in a very general sense... We're looking at types not necessarily as the way the computer resolves the information, but as a, f as a help that a language gives us as the programmer to simply make sure we're using the right kind of data. And what I mean by that is, technically speaking, a computer itself doesn't resolve the type of the information. In, a, in an untyped or weakly typed language, you can actually apply an operation to the wrong type of data, and you might get back an either an unre unusable result in the form of garbage or a crash where typing is actually seen to us as the programmer is generally in the forms in the form of restrictions or applied type checking meaning a scenario where the compiler or interpreter will not allow us to perform the operation that was going to produce garbage or a crash and let's take a uh, a very quick look at that in python itself so let's bring up an actual python prompt the interactive interpreter and let's actually play with this a little bit let us test the limits of some of the, the type restrictions. So we'll begin by asking the Python interpreter to add the number 5 with the word cat. And we get back an error saying that we have an unsupported upper type for the types integer and string. So that's very interesting. Now, this concept seems just by itself seems very simple. It's like, oh, okay, mismatch types simply can't be applied together. We do have to be careful, though, because there are scenarios where the interpreter or compiler is able to automatically convert when the types carry the same meaning. What I mean by that is take, for example, the idea of the integer 5 and the floating point number 5. Both of those are numbers, and if you look at them purely in a mathematical sense, it doesn't matter which one you're working with. Mathematically, 5 is 5. It doesn't matter if it's 5 or 5.0. So to take a look at that, let's actually stretch that, or let's begin with that example exactly. 5 plus 5.0. That results in 10.0. So that worked, and there was no errors. You also notice that the result does indeed have a decimal point, and that hints to what exactly is happening behind the scenes that allows this. When we're working in Python, we have the concept known as coercion. That is... A, an approach where the interpreter can look at the two operands and their 
types and see if either type could be promoted such that the types would then be the same and the operation could continue. So what has happened here with 5 plus 5.0 is it's noticed that both of these are numerical types and the floating point representation of 5 is numerically the same as 5, meaning 5 and 5.0 are mathematically the same thing. Therefore, 5 could be converted to 5.0 without losing any data. So what's actually happening behind the scenes is really something more like this, 5.0 plus 5.0. Once again, the same result. But the idea is simply that in a case when one operand can be automatically promoted without losing information, that will apply. Of course, there are restrictions to this, meaning that if the compiler were ever, or excuse me, the interpreter were in a scenario where it needed to convert down, you could not do this the other way. You could not take a float down to an integer because there's a chance that you would lose information. If you had the value 0 0.5 and converted that to an integer, how would you do it? You can't store the decimal information. So just keep in mind that if you see a conversion of different types working, that must mean that there is some way of interpreting the data that is information-wise the same. Now, let's move on from here, and I'm going to very quickly outline um, some of the types that we will be looking at. Of course, Python being object-oriented means we can get very much deeper into types and their implications, but just for the purpose of this video and the upcoming variables video, the types we'll be looking at are just going, are going to be boolean, integer, floating point, and string. With boolean, we simply store the information true or false, on or off, so just one value or the other. In the case of integer, of course, we're talking about non-decimal numbers, that is, whole numbers. Floating point numbers, of course, introduce the concept of having a decimal point, and the string type is a type that allows us to store alphanumeric text, much as we had begun with the example of cat. Now, let's move on from here and talk about something else, and that is type conversion. So going back to the Python prompt, we've seen how certain types, like 5 and cat, are incompatible to the operand of addition. We've seen how other types, such as inter integer and float, can be automatically coerced into working. What if we ran into a scenario where we di really did want to use two separate incompatible data types in an operation? Going back to the example of 5 and cat. Or even better, uh, let me change that. Let's say we have the operation, uh, let me jot this down and then we'll talk about it. The idea of the integer 5 plus the string 1, 2, 3. Of course, if we try to execute that straight out, we get an error because, of course, integer and string being incompatible. But let's think about this problem for a moment. This is indeed a, a valid and common problem. Let's say that you have some type of text input mechanism, maybe a command prompt or a field on a web page, and that's going to collect typed information from the user, which is generally going to be a string. Now, if your program was meant to take in numeric input, you might want to be able to use this information, meaning the string 1, 2, 3 is input that you want to be able to numerically add to. But how would we go about using this? Because, of course, you know, the string isn't usable directly. Well, this gets into explicit conversion, and that is the fact that we could take string information and convert it over to an integer so that it could be used in subsequent integer operations. For example, we could take 5, and we could use the built-in int function to convert string 1, 2, 3 over to an integer. So 5 plus the integer value of 1, 2, 3 is 128. And that's correct. So we have mathematically interpreted the value and then added 5 to it. Now you might be wondering, well, since we can do this, why doesn't that happen automatically? And there are some languages where this will happen automatically, where a string will simply be auto-converted to whatever the relevant operation is. The reason that it's not in Python, as well as, other, as well as certain other languages, is it makes sure that there are no ambiguities into how the data is going to be interpreted. The fact that you as the programmer have to specify the conversion means you as the programmer are going to know exactly what's going on. You don't have to look at a string and say, well, is this going to be, how is this going to be put together? And you might be thinking, well, it's like, well what, what, what other different possibilities would there be? Well, one possibility would be concatenation. What if we wanted to look at this information and simply add the number 5 in front of 1, 2, 3, such that we would have a string 5, 1, 2, 3? Well, we could do that by converting 5 to a string. So string value of 5 plus 1, 2, 3 would result in just that, the string 5, 1, 2, 3. 
And here, really, we've seen the same two pieces of information, that is 5 and 1, 2, 3, but converted two different ways, giving two different results. So the question comes down to, well, given the number 5 and the string 1, 2, 3, what is going to be the result, uh, 128 or 5,123? And once again, in Python, since you have to explicitly do the conversion, that means you as the programmer are always going to be able to know exactly what's going to happen and what the result is going to be. So I noticed originally you were going to do 5 plus cat and convert cat. So doing something like cat, how would Python handle converting that to a numerical value? Some things may not necessarily convert. Um, I have, to be honest, I haven't actually tried cat itself. I've tried things like um, certain kinds of numbers, like trying to turn a decimal number into an integer. But let's try cat, just for the fun of seeing what the result will be. So if we try to convert the word cat into an integer, we get an error saying that we cannot give the base 10 interpretation of the word cat. Very nice. Actually, I like that. So keep in mind that not all conversions will succeed. So that means if this is indeed user input, one might want to go through it character by character and first make sure that it's valid before we go through an attempt. Sure. And um, actually, this this leads into the uh, another thing I was going to discuss, and that is, well, the integer conversion is great for, or what we've seen with integers and strings, that's great for converting integers and strings, but what about converting other types? For example, let's say the, uh, the input was 5.25. Let's say we wanted to get that from the user and then add it to something else. So say 5 plus the string 5.25. Obviously, being a string, it's not going to work, so we need to convert it. Up until now, the only numeric conversion that we've seen has been int. 5 plus the integer value, aside from just knowing that that would probably lose data, well, in actuality, it won't even work. It's not going to give the base interpretation of, or the base 10 interpretation of 5.25. But if we still wanted to add this, well, we'd have to know in advance that A, there is a floating point type, and B, that the function to convert it was called float. 5 plus the float interpretation of the string gives 10.25. And that's correct. But wait a minute here. Now we're going into the, just this dark magic world of know what conversions exist. So how would we go about checking that? For example, let's say we wanted to convert a Boolean value. As for example, that is a true or a false. So saying, I'm trying to think of a way of showing the data type before I show the type of it. But just to show true is indeed a, a value. So we're lo with Boolean, we're looking at true or false. Both of those are valid as seen here in the interpreter. Right. Now, let's say, now granted, adding something to true isn't commonly done, but let's just say we did want to do 1 plus true. Though <laughs> that does indeed work. This is, I'm thinking for a second of, ah, yes. What if you wanted to do um, the other way around? If you wanted to convert a number to being true or false. Let's say you're reading ones and zeros out of a file where one was to be true and zero was to be false. Well, if you wanted to convert, and you were just guessing, so far we said int was just int, float was just float. So let's try to get the boolean of something. Let's get the boolean of the number one. There is no function named boolean. And this, and all of this was just to show this one function. What I wanted to get at was the type function type will let you take in any value and it will return the type that that value was. So exa for example, the type of the integer 5 is an int. 5.25 is a float, so all so far so good. Now getting back to the conversion that we're attempting, that is integer to boolean. Well, what is the type of true? Ah, that is bool, not boolean. So when referring to the type in the language itself, it's actually just bool. That means we could go back to saying the Boolean value of 1 is true, where the Boolean value of 0 is false. So Excellent. if we actually wanted to do the numeric conversion back and forth, we could use that specific type. Though that may only be more applicable in more advanced expressions. As you noticed earlier when I added 1 to true, that the fact that it would automatically coerce to an integer value when doing addition. But um, once again, just to... Uh, to reiterate the use of the type function, one well, the type can be used to see what the type is, but um, the types that we had addressed earlier, that is boolean, integer, floating point, and string, are int, float, bool, and string is simply str, as we had seen earlier. And really, having covered all that, that's what I wanted to get across in 
the data types lesson. Once again, just a quick recap is the fact that we're going to need to store data. And in Python, when we begin writing our programs, generally this data storage is going to be in terms of variables, that is, temporary information that we store in memory. Data types come in in the fact that we differentiate between different kinds of data so that we can more clearly apply operations to it and know what, exa what exactly is going to happen when we apply those operations. So really, as far as we're concerned as Python programmers, that is the point of data types, is to let us know exactly what's going to happen and maybe even allow the interpreter to warn us as to things that we shouldn't do. So with that, that is going to wrap up this lesson. Thanks a lot, everyone.